What's up everybody, Rob here. So, one of the greatest compliments a bodybuilder can receive is to be compared to a Greek statue. Eugene Sandow, who is the father of bodybuilding, would actually have exhibitions where he would coat himself in white powder in order to mimic the marble statues that he was greatly inspired by. But it wasn't always the case. I mean, statues like this and this type of artwork didn't just spring up overnight. So here we go. This is a very, very brief look at the evolution of Greek statues. All right, so before I begin, just a couple things I want to mention. First off, this is not a comprehensive look. This is just something I am not an expert on this subject. I'm not even an amateur on this subject. Something I just found out, and I figured I'd you know, share what I've learned with all of you guys. I, it, I found it interesting. I hope you do too. And this is not something you know particularly comprehensive, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on statues. This is barely scratching the surface of statues not including other forms of Greek artwork, including pottery, paintings, um, sculpture, etc., bas relief, etc., etc. This is just the most basic look at Greek statues and their evolution over the centuries. So keep that in mind. Nothing comprehensive here. Also, I will be showing several statues that showcase the human body, both male and female, in all of its anatomical glory. If that is offensive to you in some way, this is not the video for you. I have a lot of other videos that don't contain any nudity from statues. You can check those out. I care not from whence the views come, only that they do. And, uh, yep, check those out here. But these here, I refuse to censor. I will absolutely not censor history. I will not censor the past in any way whatsoever. If this is offensive to someone, I will, well, you're just going to have to get over it. And if YouTube flags this and requires that I censor, I will take it down first. I will simply not censor um, the his history or um, the past in any way. So just letting you know ahead of time, heroic nudes abound, um, male and female, just letting you know. Okay, as long as we got that cleared up, let's move on. The first period we're going to be looking at is the geometric period. It occurred roughly between 900 and 700 BC, and this is the earliest form of Greek sculpture that was found post-Mycenaean era. It features very heavily stylized geometric shapes, which are used to represent humans and animals, as the name implies. For example, very simple cylinders and cones are used to represent the various appendages of humans and animals, and there's very little in the way of realism or detail. For example, if you look at this horse right here, it's basically, if you look at its legs or its tail, it's basically just simple cylinders. There's not much weight, like you don't see any hair on it. You don't see the muscle tone at all or um, any sense of movement whatsoever. If you look at the muzzle of the horse, it's simply a cone that is attached to the rest of the body. There's uh, This is obviously a horse because, you know, what else could it possibly be? But it doesn't look like a, like a horse doesn't look like this. It's just we assume that it's a horse because, I like, like I said, I have no idea what else it could be. Humans and other creatures are really not that different. For example, you have this version here. For example, you have this statue here. You have the a human and a centaur, which is, you know, again, like the horse-like body. Again, the tail is just a cylinder. The legs are, they have some definition there that they're, well, they have some muscularity there, but you don't see too much in, by the way, of definition. And the, again, the arms and the legs are really just simple cylinders. And the head is just, this vaguely cone-like thing. And again, this is not very realistic. It's not very detailed, but it's obviously a human and a centaur because, well, it doesn't look like a human or a centaur. It's just like, you know, what else could it possibly be? So this was pretty much very typical of the geometric time period. Now, I just want to point out that many of these statues and sculptures that were from this era were probably carved out of wood, and they have, of course, decayed over the centuries. So we don't know if this is the norm or if this is just what's left over from the centuries, and this is all we happen to have found. Um, also want to point out that these were oftentimes found in tombs or other places of religious significance and were not generally for public display. This was art for a purpose, a religious significance or a spiritual significance, and not necessarily art for the aesthetics, not for the sake of beauty. Um, I just want to point out, though, on top of that, that according to one of my professors in college, whenever somebody says, oh, this object has probable religious significance that's a shorthand way of saying we have no idea what it is but we don't want to look like idiots so keep that in mind but yes it is highly likely that these were not made to be beautiful for the sake of their beauty or they were not created for their beauty but rather they were created for some sort of religious or spiritual or ritual significance and um, this is attested to by the fact that they were found mostly in tombs or in other um, locations not necessarily not necessarily like, say, on in the middle of a city or something like that. So 
there you are at the geometric period. There's not much of all the time periods. There's not really much to say about this, and there's very little evidence about what's going on during this time period. So moving on from there. All right, so the next time period we're going to be talking about here is the Archaic period, which ran roughly from 700 BC to 480 BC and shows a very stark evolution in Greek statues. Human figures became much more commonplace than they had been previously, and they were made for public viewing, not found in tombs or in places of religious significance, but rather in prominent public locations. This is art for the sake of art, beauty for its own sake. Now, these statues came usually in two particular themes. There was the Korai, or Kori. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. It's a K-O-U-R-O-I. These are nude male statues, almost exclusively of young nude men. And the Kore, uh, K-O-R-E, which are clothed female statues. Again, young women, but they are almost universally clothed. Now, these almost certainly take influence from Egyptian statues in both design and features. There was very lively Mediterranean trade, and the Greeks had contact with the Egyptians, and there is no doubt that they were heavily influenced by Egyptian statues and the themes and design of them. And you can just look at these statues here. This is very obviously highly stylized or highly based on Egyptian statues. Now, these are much more realistic than they were during the geometric period. This is obviously a human. It's not just um, like the geometric period. It was like, okay, that's a human because like what else could it possibly be? This is obviously a human, but it's still highly simplified. It is um, – there is more muscle tone, more muscle definition seen, but we're still not quite at full realism. Now, statues are – always depicted as being very upright with very extremely rigid postures, almost too rigid to be realistic. And it is almost always symmetrical. Uh, one, Whatever one arm is doing, the other arm is doing. If one arm is raised, then the other arm is raised. If, um, one arm, if the arms, as you see here, are down at the side, then the other arm is down at the side. Now, this is done almost exclusively for balance purposes in order for the uh, statue to not topple over in to make sure the weight is distributed evenly if you look at the feet one foot is placed directly in front of the other and again this is for balance purposes so that the statue does not topple over it may appear to be walking but um, this is still a very static pose uh, this is not a natural position for humans to be in and it really just doesn't show any sort of movement or dynamism there it's uh, very rigid and very stiff in its movements or in its lack of movement uh, you know what I mean. Look, you, you don't. You basically don't get any sense of motion out of this. And as far as the facial expression is concerned, it is a smiling statue. Yes, they have. They almost always have um, a slight smile on their faces, but otherwise a blank expression. There's no real emotion to them. There's, uh, like I said, there's really just not much in the way of realism here. This is just, um, this is just the human form for the sake of having the human form. Now, over time, during this time period, there was some evolution. The arms would bend more and weight would be shifted more towards one foot than the other. Uh, these here, these statues seem to be pretty evenly distributed on both feet. They did tend to shift a little bit um, towards one foot or another over time. But generally speaking, the posture was very rigid and there was always a degree of symmetry. Whatever one side does, the other side does as well. Next up is the Classical period. Now, this started after the end of the Persian Wars and lasted until the Macedonian conquests under Philip of Macedon. And it represents a major shift in the design of statues as well as the general flowering of Greek culture. This is basically the time when all the great philosophers, artwork, all the playwrights and poets and everything else. Basically, when you think ancient Greek culture, this is the time period we're talking about here. Now, the statues are much less simplified and much more detailed than they had been in previous eras. The body is much more proportionate, and there is a great emphasis on the idealized physique. Now, this is stuff that bodybuilders are trying to compare themselves to when they, you know, they say you look like a Greek statue. Now we're getting to that kind of stuff here. Now, oftentimes it depicts athletes or gods, although occasionally they would show warriors as well. And they are almost exclusively the heroic, nude, younger men, or sometimes just ageless men. And even if you have um, an older individual, say a you know heavily bearded individual that's possibly a god or something like that, the head is that of an older individual, but the body is that of an idealized youth or somebody who's you know has not been ravaged by the um, uncaring hand of time. 
There is very, very little emphasis on the female form. They are, again, almost exclusively nude heroic men, and um, they are almost never in any sort of sexual context. Now, these show very well-defined... Now, this particular style during the classical period show well-defined muscles and oftentimes a much more relaxed posture, and the weight is oftentimes distributed on one hip. They're very rarely... Um, shown in the extremely rigid posture of the archaic era. They're turning or their um, their head is moving one way, way or another. They are not symmetrical, and their feet are oftentimes placed in um, non-symmetrical positions. Uh, balance is not nearly as much of a concern here. Uh, they've managed to figure out ways to make statues not topple over without having the feet in such an unnatural position. Now, one of the great differences between the Archaic period and the Classical period is that the statues appear to be frozen in time. They appear to be, you know, doing something when they just have to be captured, like that, in, like that single moment in time. Uh, Polyclitus, who was a Greek sculptor, stated that a statue should have um, three major characteristics. Ideal proportions, a balance between tense and relaxed muscles, and a balanced orientation of limbs. Now, for example, you see here, this is a statue of a discus thrower, and he has all of the above. It most certainly has a um, ideal proportions. The statue does not have, say, bulging arms, but at the same time, small legs or anything like that. Everything is, you know, balanced and proportional. Um, one part of the body does not overwhelm or overshadow any of the other parts. There's a balance between tense and relaxed muscles. You can see that there's obviously some motion going on here, like the muscles that are about to throw the discus and that are used to throw the discus are tensed while the muscles that are not being used are obviously in a relaxed position. And a balanced, a balanced orientation of the limbs it means that everything is in a natural flowing position. Like the person is, a person could actually find themselves in this exact pose. Um, unlike the archaic statues where no, like nobody stands even that rigidly ever voluntarily, at least not voluntarily. Um, this is something that a person would could actually do in their natural, normal lives. One thing to say about the classical period, though, in addition to the fact that they are oftentimes young and idealized, is that their facial expression is almost universally blank and neutral. Maybe a slight smile here and there, uh, something like that. But generally speaking, there's not much in the way of emotion. There's motion but not emotion. There's, you can see them actually doing something, for example, tying on a headband or um, re relaxing or um, pondering something or doing some sort of action frozen in time, but they're not really expressing themselves. They're not really showing any sort of emotion. They are just have this blank neutral expression, sometimes with a slight smile to it. And there's really not much of a story to go along with this. You know, like, why is this guy throwing a discus? Well, because he's a discus thrower. End of story. Why is this guy tying on a headband? Well, because he's an athlete. That's a sign of victory. Why is he doing that? Because, well, he just does. Uh, and just a very brief look here. And just going to talk very briefly about the construction of these statues. Now, what we would have here are blocks of marble, which would be quarried and then worked with a series of iron chisels of various sizes and shapes to get out the rough features. And then small hand drills would be used for the finer details. And then eventually they would be polished with um, sand or um, gypsum, which is a very hard, abrasive um, stone, which you would then use to um, smooth everything down. And actually, I just want to point out, too, that the quality or color of the marble was not of high priority because although they are seen here in their pure white form that you see here of the natural marble, these things would be painted and they would be uh, very garishly and brightly painted. And it actually looks kind of ridiculous to our eyes here, but that's what they did. So, yeah, the, the quality of the marble actually was not of any particular importance because it was just going to be covered over anyway. And um, oftentimes there would be jewels or precious stones or, say, mother of pearl or something like that inlaid for the eyes. And oftentimes they would be given items to hold. For example, um, spears or swords or shields or other type of weapons, maybe a staff of some kind. And these would just be actual spears or swords or something like that. And these have uh, been lost to history. So uh, if you see a person or a, a statue of somebody holding their hand in position that they're holding a staff is probably because there was actually a staff or a spear there or they were holding a shield or whatever it is and that has simply been lost to history also 
in many cases, especially on the larger statues, the appendages would be made separately and then there would be holes placed in at the stump of the limb and um, they'd be fitted in with um, iron or wooden dowels and they'd just basically be fitted into place. And um, oftentimes you'll see a statue with missing limbs. It's because, well, partially either there was one piece and it broke off, which is possible, or that the that particular piece has just simply come loose. And um, it's kind of like, you know, think of all your toys when you were a child. How many how many of them have missing arms and legs because they just pop off because it's a separate piece that gets, you know, popped into place? Same idea here. So just giving you just a brief look at the construction. But yeah, basically, there's there you go. That is the classical period. Okay, so last up, we have the Hellenistic period, which occurred roughly from the time of Alexander the Great till, well, the Romans came and took over the place. And like the classical statues, this time period emphasized proportion and detail, and oftentimes in very heroic, um, you know, the typical heroic nude, but oftentimes in a much more dramatic setting. So it's not really the design of the statue itself, but the theme and the emotion that's being conveyed that really can separate the Hellenistic period from the classical period. Uh, for example, older individuals, and as opposed to just the young heroic nude, is commonplace, as well as individuals who are wounded or tired or in pain or ill or in some way not in the idealized form. For example, you have here one of the most famous ones. This is Lao Khan and his sons, which is one of the most famous statues of this era. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. I'm sorry, but, you know, it's me again. What do you expect? In any case, this is a myth from the Trojan War. You have Lao Khan here and his sons. He was a Trojan who was trying to warn the Trojans that the giant wooden horse that just mysteriously appeared outside of the abandoned Greek camp was actually full of Greeks and oh, do totally don't bring it into the city because it's a bad idea. And to prevent this from happening, Athena caused a bunch of serpents to pop up and uh, basically attack and kill him and his sons and um, preventing well, preventing them from not bringing the Trojan horse in. And, well, you know how that all ended up. But in any case, you see here, uh, you have the the form of Laocon. He is definitely a physically very fit individual. This guy certainly lifts. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But um, he's in pain. He is suffering. His sons are suffering. They are struggling to get out of the grasp of these serpents. Uh, they are probably been poisoned. You can see the anguish on their faces. Their bodies are bent, writhing in agony. They're trying desperately to find, um, to fend off these serpents, and they are just obviously struggling here. That is something that is very, very difficult to find in uh, the classical period. It would They would never have a theme like this during that particular era. It would always be the idealized person, you know, standing upon um, the cusp of victory or uh, basically, you know, triumphing over the odds. Here's a guy and his sons in absolute like the worst possible moment of their lives. This is like the most traumatic experience they've ever gone through and they're going to die soon and they know it and you can see that written plainly on their faces and in their body language. So there's a much higher degree of emotion that you would ever find in a classical statue. And it doesn't even have to be something quite this dramatic here. This is actually one of my favorites here. This is uh, known as a boxer at rest or the boxer at rest. And this is... Like the classical period, it's an emphasis on an athlete, in this case a boxer, but he's not there triumphing over his opponent or you know getting ready for a match. This guy's exhausted. He just probably went through you know a match. He might even have been defeated. Like you know, for all I know, like there's a story here. And did he win? Did he lose? Is he is he about to face his next opponent? And doesn't want to. Like who's he looking up at? Is it like you know, he's like somebody come over. Okay, man, it's time to go get back in the ring. He's like, do I really have to? Like, you know, they didn't have rounds in uh, ancient Greek boxing, but, um, you know, you can see this if, say, there was rounds. Like, he's in between rounds, or in between fights, rather. And um, he's just, like, doesn't want to get back in the ring, but he knows he has to. Like, there's this resigned look on his face. His posture is one of slumped. His shoulders are rolled forward. He's obviously exhausted. He's just, you know, this guy has been through hell, and um, he's about to either go back in or he's refusing to do so. But the thing is, we don't really know, but that's the thing. There's a story here. Uh, there, you can absolutely tell that this is, you know, somebody who has something, you know, some experience that he went through, and uh, you can absolutely read that here. Something that, again, a classical statue of the same theme, a boxer in a classical statue, you would never see that. It would just be him standing triumphant, and that would be the end of it. 
another big difference between the classical period and the Hellenistic period was the Hellenistic period's emphasis on the female form, or much more so than the classical period. The classical period, there are a few female statues, but almost exclusively it is the nude heroic male. During the Hellenistic period, however, there is a greater emphasis on, of course, the male statue, which does predominate. Uh, does predominate, but the female form is much more commonplace than had been previously. And you'd have both clothed and unclothed female statues. You have a clothed version here. This is Winged Victory, and it's um, the goddess Victory, Nike, and she is flying somewhere. Uh, we don't really know where or why. Her face, unfortunately, is, you know, the head's missing, so we don't really understand her facial expression. But she is descending, you can imagine, descending from the heavens to bestow victory upon a general. Even without the head, you can definitely sense there's a sense of motion here, a sense of purpose. She's going towards something. She's not just, again, static there, um, you know, reveling in her divine glory. She's, you know, actively doing something. You can see her robes. She is um, obviously... In motion of some kind, they're being pushed back. She's um, her wings are folded backwards, trying to control herself, possibly as she's landing. Um, there's there's a lot to say here, even without a head. There's some emotion, some here, some dynamism, even without the facial expression of the head. Now, and one other big difference between the Hellenistic period and the other periods, particularly the classical period, was the sexualization of the statues. Now. The heroic nude had been around since, honestly, well, since the geometric period, nudes had been uh, part of Greek statue and Greek culture, uh, but it was never sexualized. The uh, People back then had different views of nudity than we have today. They were just basically showing the human form in all of its idealized glory and uh, not necessarily in any sort of sexual context. This statue you see here, this is the Venus de Milo. Uh, it's one of the most famous statues in the world. I'm sure you've seen it previously. This is, in fact, a sexualized image. This is a woman who is obviously in the process of disrobing. Now, it, some people say that this is... Now, general consensus is that this is a depiction of the goddess Aphrodite. Um, some say it's a local sea nymph. Uh, it was on the island of uh, Milos. That's why it's um, Venus de Milo. It's on the island of Milos. Um, others say it's just a random woman. It doesn't really matter. The point, though is that this is a sexualized image. This is blatantly sexual. Uh, she is actively disrobing. She is trying to seduce somebody. Um, she is actively disrobing. It's, you can't tell where her arms would be because um, they unfortunately fell off. But she is obviously in a position to try to seduce somebody. And um, there's, again, a tremendous amount of emotion there. There's love. There's lust. There's uh, desire, wanting. All of those things are easily depicted here and if you know anything about ancient greek culture they took a rather dim view of women and they thought like i actually think pericles talked about that a woman who's even spoken about as a good woman is actually bad because she's spoken about like the woman who's spoken about not at all is actually the best uh, it seems that during the hellenistic period they seem to be getting over this particular um rampant misogyny and toning it down slightly not saying it was a feminist paradise or anything just like they they toned down their um uh, basically, they tried to ignore women. They, at least, at least here they're acknowledging that women exist and they do play a role in society. Uh, I'm not going to go too much further into that, but um, yeah, you do have in during this time period much more in the way of female figures. And again, there's emotion and um, action and dynamism within female statues. Again, which had not been seen during the classical period or any other period up to this point. Eventually, the Romans would conquer the lands that were under control of the Greeks after the conquests of Alexander the Great, and thusly bringing an end to the Hellenistic period of art. And thusly, we are at the end of this video. Thank you for staying with me this long. I hope you found it interesting and entertaining. It's something I'm not an expert at. It's something I'm not very well versed in at all, but I found it interesting, and I figured I'd share it with all of you guys. And I just thought you hope hopefully you enjoyed it. And I'm working on a very large project right now, and I want to get some videos out. I'm going to be doing some smaller ones before this major project comes out. And also things have been pretty hectic at work, so I haven't been able to put out videos as much as I would have liked. But, you know, hey, such is life. Any case, um, as always, please hit the like and subscribe button as well as the notification bell. More videos will be coming out whenever I get around to it. And have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. See you later.